Let's give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to Mr. Kevin Hyman. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, my name is Kevin Heineman. Uh, if you are here to look for Val Romani, I'm sorry to disappoint, but I'm going to be filling in with her today. She is uh, actually the CEO of Dumbala uh, and is out on the West Coast and couldn't make it. Uh, but uh, the story that I want to tell you today is I want to take you through the journey of a startup, uh, pretty much from the beginning to the end. Um, and while I've been at Dumbala for just a few months, I'm going to be talking most of the time today about Spy Dynamics, which is the previous company that I worked for. Uh, and that was the company that I really was uh, experienced the whole life cycle um, of the startup. Um, but, uh, you know, before we go ahead and get into all of this, uh, I want to take a little bit of time. Uh, you did get an introduction of who I am, but um, I want to tell you a little bit more about my background. Um, I graduated from the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, graduated with a degree in finance. Uh, went on to get my MBA from Rice University in finance and accounting. Um, when I graduated from Rice, I had two job offers. I had one from a bank uh, and I had one from a consulting company that built accounting software for the oil and gas industry. And as many of you might be going through right now, when you talk to the placement office, they say, well, you know, map, match up your long-term goals with the company goals and, you know, are you going to be a good fit and go through all the analysis and things like that. And I did. But then when it came down to it, you pick the offer that pays you more money. So I became a consultant in the software industry. And for the last 20 years, I've been building and launching commercial grade software applications. Um, and what I've done, actually, for the last 10 of those years, I've done that uh, in a senior management role. Management role. That's a, a role director and above. I've managed teams uh, as large as 150, and I've also managed organizations as small as four. Uh, so run the gamut. Uh, I've built software for large companies like Bell South and IBM, and uh, small companies like Dembala and, uh, and Spy Dynamics. And truly, um, the, uh, the joy and the passion that I have is building, building software for small companies and building and growing uh, small companies. And hopefully one day, those small companies will become large companies. Um, I've had 10 years of consulting background. Uh, that's where I got my start, uh, working with companies and helping them launch uh, their software. Uh, and then I moved in-house and started taking full responsibility uh, for the end-to-end -end software development lifecycle. I've had four years of uh, remote experience, leading remote teams, um, for both onshore and offshore, to help supplement the local development staff uh, in building software more efficiently. And I'm currently the vice president of engineering uh, at Dembala, which is a uh, a small startup uh, here in town located right, right across the street at the Biltmore. Uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about uh, what Dumbala does later in the presentation. So before we get uh, into too much, I want to talk to you about who Spy Dynamics is. Has anybody heard of Spy Dynamics? Probably not. Um, Spy was a local company uh, here in Atlanta. It was founded in 1999 by a couple of guys from ISS's X-Force. Uh, at the time, in the late 90s, ISS was uh, really in its growth stage, uh, and they came to ISS management with an idea that said, there is a security problem in web applications, and we think there would be a great product that would be able to, uh, to solve this problem. Um, well, the ISS management uh, didn't think that it was going to be that good of an idea, so these guys quit ISS. They went out, they got some funding, uh, and they made their own company called Spy Dynamics. And what SPY produced is it produced an assessment tool that would assess web applications for security vulnerabilities. Basically what this tool would do is it would, um, it would act like a hacker. It would be an automated attack of a website, and it would tell the user, okay, here's the holes within this website, here's the data and the damage that someone could do if they broke in, and here's what you have to do to remediate those problems. Um, the target markets for a, a product like this would be pretty much anybody that's got a large web presence, any Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 company, that if they got hacked, you know, they would end up on the front of the Wall Street Journal. So it was Fortune 1000, it was federal, it was large international conglomerates. Um, we had verticals like the healthcare space. There was a lot of um, need to protect PCI and patient information. Uh, a lot of need in the financial or the insurance space to protect uh, all of our money uh, uh, that's online. 
Uh, in manufacturing, there's these huge supply chains within large manufacturing organizations, uh, and all of it is web-based. And to make sure that the vulnerabilities of one company don't flow in through other companies, it was very, very important to protect, uh, to, to have applications that would help protect that. So we sold this application into QA organizations. Uh, they would test web applications before it would go into production. Uh, and we also sold it on into production teams that would test this application against production websites to make sure that there wasn't anything that was introduced, any vulnerabilities that were introduced uh, in the field uh, in production. So let me give you a little bit of background about where I was in my career leading up to Spy Dynamics. I had been working in large corporate environments up to this point. I had worked for companies like Ernst & Young. I had been in Atlanta working for WorldSpan, um, managing large organizations, large development shops. Uh, but at that time, I was really looking for something different. I was looking for uh, an organization that I could really build from the ground up. And along came Spy Dynamics, uh, and Spy was in the security space. And one of the things that really attracted me to Spy Dynamics was security. Security was important back in, in uh, 2002 when I joined the company. Security is important now, and I think security is going to be important in the future. And here's a couple of reasons why I think security matters most. And first and foremost is that technology is changing quickly. Um, back in the early 2000s, it was all about Web 1.0, right? Uh, now it's Web 2.0, and we're even talking about Web 3.0. And as new technologies is introduced, those new technologies introduce more complexities, and those complexities require more security because there's more and more attack vectors that can come in and actually cause uh, security flaws within an application. Um, also, the brick and mortar organization is long gone. In fact, I'm not sure we even use that term anymore. Um, but the concept of having an organization that can really secure itself by lock and key uh, doesn't exist anymore, that organizations um, are blended and there's not really a clear delineation between when one organization starts and another organization stops. I mean, if you take Walmart, for example, when you go buy something at Walmart and it scans at the cash register, that information is sent to a distributor somewhere that uh, looks at inventory and says, I need to send more, more product to Walmart to restock their shelves. And that could be many different companies along the way and all of those companies are uh, connected through the web. And so as, as these organizations become more connected, the need for protecting all of that data is more important. Um, data is now digital in real time. I mean, in, in the generation that, that uh, the generation in this crowd and even generation from my kids, uh, more and more uh, data is streaming. Uh, it's available to us at our fingertips. Uh, and protecting that massive amounts of data is, is a complex task. Um, next, moving to the cloud. Uh, the cloud is not a buzzword anymore. The cloud, cloud's a reality. You can do, uh, you can process in the cloud, applications sit in the cloud, data sits in the cloud. You may not even know where all of this stuff exists. You just know that you pull your phone out, you pull your laptop out, and things work. Uh, protecting all of that is a very, very complex task. It's almost the, the same kind of concept that the old mainframe systems were, where you had a central host and you had a bunch of dumb terminals. The difference, though, in that kind of a, comp in that kind of a, uh, a model is that a mainframe model be can be self-contained, and all the security within the mainframe is self-contained. But in the, in the cloud, you have so many different technologies that are interacting together that protecting that data is a very, very complex task. And then everything's connected. Uh, you know, you can log on to a website now and change the temperature in your house. Uh, you can stream uh, your movies uh, from your PC onto your TV, and you can download Netflix and things of that sort. So as things become more and more interconnected, all of that stuff, and we become more and more dependent upon the data, uh, the, sec the security of this is going to become more and more important in our lives. So that was one of the, the main reasons why I chose uh, to join Spy Dynamics. And I joined Spy. I was... Um, uh, the Vice President of Engineering, my responsibilities at SPY included uh, development, QA, customer support, um, production operations, professional services, training, all with a staff of three people. So we had lots of responsibility. We had not a lot of people to do all of that stuff. Um, and when we were at SPY, when we first were getting started at SPY, uh, we had a great idea. The idea was this web application security product. Had a lot of passion around that product, um, but we didn't have any sales and we didn't have any customers. Uh, and as we were getting started, we quickly ran into a lot of challenges. 
And these are just some of the challenges that we, we had as an early startup. Uh, first, the need is unknown. When we'd go out and talk to prospects, if a prospect had not been hacked and they didn't have any loss of data, they'd say, I'm not really sure why you're valuable to me. Um, I don't feel pain. I've got you know, 100 other projects that are higher priority than your project. What is, what is the need that, uh, uh, why do I need to have your, your product? Um, and they didn't know why it was important. They would say things like, well, I've got a vendor that uh, just sold me a firewall, and they told me it was going to solve all my security problems. So why are you telling me now that it doesn't solve all of my security problems? And I don't feel any pain, so I don't have a need uh, to purchase your product. Uh, third, the business value was unknown. We didn't have an ROI. We didn't have any customer that we could go to that said, hey, you know, we've been using this product for two or three years, and it's saved X amount of money, or it's protected us in such and such a way. Uh, so we had to generate our own ROI, and we did that using what we called uh, FUD, or fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, and when you're using FUD, you can, uh, you can come up with worst case scenario. And we can't do an out-of-band approval, uh, so you're just going to have to wait until the next budget cycle. You're just going to have to wait until next year. A lot of times with these customers, we'd have to go in and sell them just the initial, uh, the, the initial sale and see if we could grow this account as more budget became available in, in future years. Um, no established credit. That was an interesting one. Where I came from in large organizations, if I needed to buy something, for my team, it was real easy to do. I could call down to procurement. I could say, hey, you know, I need X number of computers. Uh, I've got approval in my budget. And then once you go through an approval process, these things just magically show up on your floor, and you can use them. In a small company, you can't do that. Small companies don't have any credit. Uh, we couldn't just call up Dell or HP and say, hey, I want to order some machines. Um, they would say, well, you either have to pay cash or you have to put it on a credit card. And if you pay cash, it's not that easy to, uh, to have a cash transaction between two companies anyway. So we spent a lot of, a lot of time putting money on, a, uh, on personal credit cards. Most of the time, it was my personal credit card. Um, and one of the lessons I learned on this one is that if you actually charge more than your annual salary, your credit score will go down, even if you pay off your bill. Um, so we did that. That happened for, that, that was about two years until we could establish uh, some, some credible payment history and then start building some credit for the company so that we could start buying stuff for ourselves. And finally, we had a shoestring budget. Uh, it is a myth that once you get um, funding that you now have the, the money that you need to go off and do this great idea that, uh, that, that the VCs have given you money to do. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money, especially when you're using somebody else's money. There's a lot more scrutiny on that. So there was a lot of reaching in one pocket and saying, how much do I have and what are my needs, and reaching in the other pocket and trying to map those things together so that you could grow the company prudently, but not outgrow the company, out outgrow your sales and get yourself into trouble, uh, and find a way that, uh, that you could actually get your job done with the budget that you had. So what was the approach that we had to solve some of these challenges? Well, first and foremost, we wanted to act big while being small. Uh, we were a company of about uh, 10 to 15 people when we started off. But when we walked into a customer, we wanted to act like we were IBM. We wanted to have a professional looking website. We wanted to have the glossy decks. We wanted to have a sales presentation that looked very professional. We wanted, to have a, um, uh, we wanted people to recognize who we were. Uh, so we wanted to act big and look big. Um, we didn't want customers to look at us and say, hey, these guys are so small, we don't even know if they're going to be around in a year or two. Um, why should we take the risk on them? Uh, we also wanted to be small. We wanted to be able to pick up the phone on the first time it rings when a customer calls. And we wanted the person that talked to that customer to be able to solve that customer's problem, and they didn't have to get transferred to two or three different people before they were able to solve the problem. Um, we wanted to be able to react to customers when they saw problems out in the field that we could get them fixes to the software very quickly so they're not waiting for six months or a year, wait for the next version of the software. Uh, so we wanted to be able to be very nimble uh, and then mature the product very quickly. Uh, secondly, we wanted to stay focused. And this is probably um, one of the biggest lessons that we learned as a small company. Um, but when you're working, when you're, when you're in a startup and you're in a brand new market, uh, there's lots of different opportunities or lots of different things that you could focus your time on. Um, and it's very easy to get distracted. And, it's, and if you get distracted too much and you have too many balls up in the air, you're going to drop all of them. So we wanted to stay focused on one and only one thing. Um, and that was a difficult thing for us to do. And the lesson that we learned 
is when we got started with uh, SPY Dynamics, the uh, SPY actually was an acronym that stood for Secure, Protect, and Inspect. And the model that we had was we were going to have three different product lines. We were going to have an inspection product line that was this assessment tool that we were selling. Uh, we we're going to have a protection product line, which was going to be a web application firewall uh, that would protect against vulnerabilities on the inbound side. And then we we're going to have some secure product, which may, may have been a forensic product or something. We hadn't really thought that far ahead um, at that point. Uh, so that was our business model. And in fact, that business model was one that ISS had used and had been very successful with it. So it was a proven business model, one that we felt we could replicate in a new part of the industry. Uh, and we started building both the inspection product as well as the protection product. Well, we got to the point of almost releasing a beta of the protection product, and we killed it. Uh, and the reason we killed it was because we knew it wouldn't focus the company. We knew that if we released two products, they, they would have to sell into two different parts of the organization. We'd have to have two different sales teams. We'd have to have two different skill sets. Our marketing would have to be uh, two different types of marketing campaigns. Uh, support would be very, very different. And as it stood, we were, we were stretched pretty thin trying to handle one product. Two products would have, um, we wouldn't have been able to support two, uh, both of those products. And in fact, both would have failed. And looking back, that truly was a company, um, uh, a company saving decision. There were several companies at the time that got a lot of VC funding uh, and focused solely on the, um, the protection space, solely on the web application firewall, and none of them made it. Uh, the web application firewall market really didn't materialize for about five years after that. And so we were ahead of the market, and um, it just would not have worked. So, so that, was, uh, that was a huge lesson for us. Uh, next is clarifying the win. Clarifying the win is all about execution. It's all about making sure that everybody in the company is working toward the same goal. And uh, goal setting is something that, that they probably teach you in business school. Um, it does actually work. Uh, you need to make sure that it's communicated well, that everybody understands uh, what needs to be achieved. And then when you achieve those, those wins, you need to celebrate those successes, no matter how big or how small. Um, next is uh, work on the business as well as in it. This is straight out of Stephen Covey. This is making sure that you do work on strategy. At a startup, you can spend all your working hours in the details of the business and still not get everything you need to get done uh, completed. But you need to make sure that every once in a while, you pick your head up, you look over the trees, and you say, hey, are we going in the right direction? Do we need to make adjustments? Uh, what adjustments do we need to make? And then you put your head back down, and you start focusing on the execution. You pick it back up, and you do it again. If you don't do that periodically, then you just, and, and you're in a new market, and that new market is emerging, you could completely miss the mark. Uh, finally, you need to know your customers. Um, knowing your customers uh, better than they know themselves. When we're in a new market, uh, and the web application space was, was brand new at the time, uh, customers didn't know what they wanted. They didn't know what they wanted today, and they certainly didn't know what they needed 12 months from now. Um, it was our job to figure out what that was. It was our job to become the industry experts, the thought leaders, if you might, uh, that will be saying, this is the trend. This is where web application security needs to be going. We spent a lot of time speaking at conferences, publishing white papers, educating the market, educating our customers. Uh, and it started to work. After about 12 months, 18 months, customers started coming to us. And they started asking for our opinions. We would have um, uh, trade journals and, and newspapers uh, start calling us up and, and, and getting quotes when, when things happened in the news. Uh, because we were recognized as that thought leader and we did know our customers very well. So these first five bullets are all about, I think, about the company uh, overcoming some of the challenges. The last two are just more personal. Uh, the first one is one of the lessons that I, I learned and is do what you do best. I think it's a misnomer that the boss is the one that has to be able to do a job better than anybody that works for him. Uh, if that's the case, I would have been in a whole lot of trouble. Uh, at SPY, we had, uh, I was responsible for the operations uh, group. And up until SPY, I had only worked in software development. I hadn't managed a data center. I didn't have any hardware in my background. I really didn't know what, what to do when it came to uh, running a data center. Um, so I knew that, that I wouldn't be able to do that and do that very well. But I hired an A player. Uh, who did know how to do that. 
Um, I gave him guardrails. I gave him, gave him uh, a guidance and strategy on where it needed to go. And then I got out of his way, and I let him do his job. And he excelled at that, and it turned out that we had uh, you know, a, a operation center that was second to none, particularly for a small company. The, uh, the level of uptime that we had was uh, surprising for, uh, based on other people within our industry. Uh, and then lastly, have a passion for what you do. If you don't enjoy what you do, if you, if you have to motivate yourself uh, and push yourself just to get out of bed in the morning, um, you, know, you really need to take a hard look and say, is it the environment? Is it my attitude? Maybe it's the work that I'm doing. Um, but if you're not enjoying it, you're not going to excel at it. And look back in, in your life and look back in your career and say, OK, what were the, the aspects that, uh, that I found that I, that I really did well? Or, or what, what job was that? And what was it, what was it about that job uh, that I truly enjoyed? And then try to match that with your skill sets and your education uh, to come up with a win-win. So here's some milestones along the way for Spot Dynamics, uh, just to kind of give you a brief history of, of, of how the, uh, the life cycle of the company. We received our Series A funding in December of 2001. That was about, uh, I believe it was about three and a half million dollars uh, was, was the A round of funding. And with that money, we hired a sales team, hired a marketing team, uh, and I came and joined to uh, run the engineering group. We didn't have revenues that first quarter, revenues next to nothing, customers next to nothing. Uh, but we started to get some traction, and by the third quarter, we had about a million dollars in revenue. Uh, by the end of that year, we had signed our 100th customer. Um, we really started to get some traction, and by September, third quarter of 2003, we were now doing about a million dollars a quarter, and we were really seeing some good growth. Um, January 2004, we, we got our 50th employee. And when you hit 50 employees, you really move from the startup mode to more of the small company mode. It's not quite the same feel as you have when you have 10 or 15 people. Um, we started, we continued to grow through 2004 and 2005. Uh, we hit our big um, milestone in 2005 when we became cash flow positive. And from a company's perspective, when you become cash flow positive and you're, you're running under venture capital money, that's the time where you become self-sustaining. And you don't have to lean on your venture capital, capitalists to continue to pump money uh, into the organization. Uh, so we became cash flow positive in 2005. Uh, September of that year, we hit $10 million in annual revenue. Uh, in uh, about 15 months later, we doubled it again to about $20 million in annual revenue. And somewhere in between, we, we hired our 100th employee uh, and really started to get some good growth. First, uh, spring of 2007, our thousandth customer was signed, um, and then we had the acquisition. Uh, Hewlett Packard came in, made us an offer that we couldn't refuse, and in July of 2007, we were acquired by Hewlett Packard. Um, and I'll be honest with you, when the, uh, when the acquisition started coming, we spent a lot of time focused on the transaction of the acquisition, and we didn't spend enough time thinking about what's going to happen after the acquisition. Uh, and our lives changed significantly and significantly very quickly. Um, during the due diligence process of the acquisition, Spy Dynamics, we had uh, about three people on the uh, due diligence team. Uh, HP had close to 100, um, all of whom were asking for our time at uh, all hours of the day and night. And we were burning it pretty hard as part of a startup. But when you go through an acquisition process, it steps it up uh, to a whole nother level. Um, so we had, uh, we had some challenges. Uh, we had some things that we didn't expect. We moved from about uh, 140 employees at the time to an organization with an HP. Uh, HP has about 300,000 employees. Uh, it's one of the biggest companies in the world, about $120 billion in revenue. The, uh, the division that purchased us was called HP Software. And HP Software alone was $3.5 billion. Uh, and if you took that and stood it out all by itself, it would probably be in the top five or six uh, largest software companies in the world. Uh, it's just a huge organization. Um, so we had some challenges once the acquisition occurred. Um, and the challenge is probably the biggest one was getting recognized within the broader organization. HP is huge. Um, and it has relationships at the highest levels of all companies with, uh, in the world. And, they, and, and so it was very easy for HP to, uh, to be able to get in front of decision makers to sell its products, uh, which is very different than when we were at Spy Dynamics, and it was very 
very hard to get to the decision makers. We would have to start lower in the organization and work our way up. The challenge was, was you just couldn't call up any one of these companies and say, hey, I've got a great new product here. We just got bought by HP. You should look at it. Uh, we actually had to sell ourselves within the HP organization to, and compete against all the other HP products for that time in front of the customer. Um, which, so we, it was almost selling before the selling uh, that we had to go through. Um, stay focused. That was something that we had to do as a, as a startup. It's something you have to do within, when, when you're within a larger organization. But it's a different kind of focus. We had at HP uh, large corporate-wide initiatives that were designed to, to push costs out of the organization. Uh, you know, millions and millions of uh, dollars in costs. Uh, just to give you a quick example, I got a... I got an email one day that said, hey, we're going to, to print duplex on all of our printing as default. It's going to save the company $50 million. And I was like, Man, that's a lot of paper. Uh, you know, our, our, our business unit is only about $20 million. Um, but it just goes to show you how large an organization is when something as simple as that can save that much money. So there was a lot of these, these enterprise-wide initiatives. And you had to balance your time between something for the corporate good, which is going to cost uh, time and resources within your department, as well as uh, with the individual goals that you had for your business unit, which you're still responsible for. And so you had to make sure that you stayed focused and balanced between those two things. Uh, marketing and external communication changed and changed drastically. When we we're at a startup, it's very easy to go out and make a marketing campaign, talk to our customers when, whenever we wanted. Uh, at HP, it was very different. Uh, we needed to make sure that we communicated to our customers within the broader, uh, broader brand of HP, that we were able to um, uh, talk to our customers uh, that, and, and there wouldn't be any conflicts with other products and, and how uh, those products were talking to our customers. So we had to find new ways to communicate with our customers and stay relevant. Uh, we actually created a, a channel through the product itself that we could push communications down uh, to our users so that they could be notified uh, of things that uh, we felt were important that we needed to get out of our user base that we couldn't get out through other marketing channels. Um, however, we had new sales channels. Uh, HP has uh, verticals in, in pretty much every industry uh, across the board. They're in um, 180 countries around the world. Um, all HP customers that would be interested in, in using new products uh, like a, a, a web application assessment tool. Uh, and so our sales, our sales team could go out and find a lot of low-hanging fruit from the existing uh, customer base within HP. Um, we also had uh, challenges around customer retention and around staff retention. Whenever there's an acquisition, it's uh, always going to breed uncertainty. And when you have uncertainty, there's a lot of fear. Uh, and so we spent a lot of our time post-acquisition, working with employees on staff retention, uh, working with customers um, on customer retention. Fortunately, at the same time, our main competitor got purchased by IBM. So there wasn't too much uh, difficulty in the market uh, with customers wanting to jump ship to maybe another customer that would be uh, more stable at the time. Uh, so customer retention was actually uh, a little bit easier. But staff retention, after the first 12 months, our attrition rate wasn't any different at HP than it was at Spy Dynamics. Uh, and over the first 12 months, that's really when the employees are going to be most at risk for leaving. Uh, facilities, hardware, and budget were always a challenge. A challenge at a small company, there's going to be a challenge at a big company. Um, but like staying focused, it was different kinds of challenges. Um, one story I like to tell is that when HP uh, purchased Spy, they wanted to consolidate the office space. And HP has a facility out in Alpharetta, so they wanted to move us out to Alpharetta. Uh, and, and Spy was a, a Dell shop. Um, obviously, HP doesn't like Dells. And they said, well, we'd really prefer that you don't bring your Dell equipment with you. Um, but I didn't have any budget to buy HP equipment. So, uh, and they didn't have any budget to give me to buy HP equipment. So I convinced them. I said, we, we got to be able to do our job. We're a software company. We need our computers. So uh, the agreement that was made was, OK, bring your Dell equipment. But as you get budget, you need to replace that Dell equipment with HP equipment. OK, no problem. So we move into the facility. Uh, we have our lab. Um, I finally get new budget. I buy my nice HP server that's going to be able to replace you know, a whole rack of old Dell, Dell systems that are reaching the end of their useful life anyway. Uh, so I call down the facilities and say, hey, um, 
I uh, got my new uh, HP server. I'm ready to shut off all these, uh, these Dell systems, but I need um, additional electrical work done in the lab so that I can plug the machine in. And uh, I get the response, no, I'm sorry, we can't give you any more electricity. We're out of electricity. And I said, out of electricity? How can we be out of electricity? You know, this is the 21st century. Well, it turns out the facility that we're in uh, actually produces its own power. And it was at maximum production of power, and they couldn't allocate any more power to our lab. Uh, so we went through a process of having to convince them that our footprint would actually be reduced if we shut down this rack of 12 servers and we brought up just one server. Um, but it goes to show that, you, I mean, the point of the story is that we spend an awful lot of, of my time focused on internal issues, uh, focused on getting ourselves recognized, focused on kind of getting through all of the bureaucracy and the barriers within the organization so that the rest of the team can stay focused on delivering the software and meeting the customer's needs and really not having any interruption uh, of the delivery of the software because of the acquisition with HP. So what are some of the lessons learned? Um, first off, if you don't hear anything else, uh, you'll, you'll never hear at a startup, oh, this is how it's always been done. Uh, when you get into a large organization, you might hear that all the time. But certainly at a startup, you won't hear that. And it's mostly because it's never been done before. And a lot of times when these t types of conversations uh, happen, you have somebody kind of scratch their head and say, yeah, you know, that, that's a good idea. Uh, it's probably important for us to do. Um, well, we need to do it. So you kind of look around and you say, OK, well, all the assignments that I've given to everybody are also important things that we have to get done. So you can't be afraid to roll up your sleeves and go ahead and do it yourself. Um, and at, in a small company, you're going to wear a lots and lots of different hats. Uh, and that's one of the exciting things about working for a startup. Um, you need to build process. Process is, a, uh, is, is kind of a tricky thing within a startup. You can't introduce too much process too early because you will bog down the company's ability to execute and the company's ability to be flexible. Um, but you can't stay chaotic as you grow because it's not sustainable and it's not scalable. So you need to be able to introduce process a little bit at a time and then be able to mature that process as the company grows. And that's not an easy thing to do. And you have to be able to convince people that um, process is an important thing to do, but only enough processes that, that we need to have for our current needs. And finally, you need to celebrate the small successes. As I was talking about earlier, in terms of clarifying the win, uh, when, uh, when you clarify the win uh, and set the goals and then execute toward them, no, no matter how small they are, you want to make sure that you celebrate success along the way. And that builds momentum. It builds uh, a lot of uh, teamwork. It builds a lot of positive energy around the company. And that, uh, that, that just snowballs uh, as, as the company grows. And it's a very, very important part of a, um, of a startup. So what's next? Well, now it's time to do it all over again. SPY uh, was acquired by Hewlett Packard in August of 2007. The acquisition uh, into Hewlett Packard took over two years to get SPY uh, into Hewlett Packard. Um, and now that I've worked for a big company, turned out, turned around, worked for a startup, and now work for a big company again, uh, I want to do it all over again. I want to work for another startup and hopefully grow that thing so that uh, it'll be purchased for a large company, work for a large company for another couple of years, and then maybe be back here to speak uh, in four or five years from now after Dimbala does a great thing. Um, so I'm working from Dimbala now. Dimbala is very similar to Spy Dynamics in the early days. Uh, it's running under venture capital money. Uh, we are not uh, cash flow positive yet. Uh, we are growing. Uh, we're about 50 employees. Uh, we're in the security space. We build an appliance that sits on a corporate network and detects the presence of bots and malware. And like web application security was back in 2001, 2002, this technology is a brand new technology. Uh, and we're running into a lot of the objections and a lot of the challenges that we faced when I was at Spy Dynamics. Uh, but having been through it once, we can better anticipate how we want to uh, react to those challenges from our, from our prospects. So there's lots of risks and there's lots of questions, but on the flip side of that, there's lots and lots of potential. So that's what I have today. Thanks for your time. And uh, do you have any questions? We've got, a, we've got a mic coming down here. 
you, you said you're ready to do it all over again. Uh, we've got a lot of folks behind me. We lose a ton of our Georgia Tech talent to the West Coast and to other locations because these startups seem like they are, they, they seem to perform better, they have more advantage, maybe if they start up in Palo Alto. Uh, would you do it, now that you're doing it all over again, are you, are you glad you're in Atlanta? Would you recommend to tell everybody to stay in Atlanta? Is this the place to be for a startup? Uh, yeah, so um, I'm probably not the best guy to answer that question because the startup, um, uh, the startup uh, industry here in Atlanta is not a very good one. Uh, certainly not when you compare it to the West Coast or to Technology Triangle or maybe to Austin or something like that. Uh, and there was a study done here at Georgia Tech uh, about a year ago about the, the venture community uh, here in Georgia and how well uh, it, it actually breeds startups and, and it wasn't very uh, complimentary of the Atlanta market. Um, and I would tend to agree with that. Um, but my family's here, my roots are here, uh, and Atlanta's where, where I want to stay. Uh, and one thing that 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 study did did show that I'm, I'm not sure that I, I completely agree with, but I think it said that 80 percent of all startups uh, leave the Atlanta area. Uh, and I would look at Spy Dynamics and say, well, we were acquired by Hewlett Packard, which is a West Coast country uh, company, but we did not leave the area. Uh, we just our headquarters uh, got moved, but all the staff stayed here. Uh, and I have a feeling that that does happen. Same thing with ISS. ISS was acquired by IBM, but you know their headquarters and their staff are, are still here. So I'm not, I'm not sure I, I fully agreed with that study, but anybody that is interested in getting into um, uh, the tech community and, and startups here in Atlanta, um, I think there's a lot of potential because there's a lot of virgin territory uh, here in Atlanta. So I would, I would encourage you to stay, stay here. Hello. You mentioned um, that you were never here. Um, that's what that's what is what's always been done with your startups. Um, but is there any information that you can glean from your future startup uh, that you can take with your startup with Dumbala? I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? I okay. Um, you mentioned that in a startup, you will never hear the phrase "that's how it's always been done." Uh -huh. But you're at a new company, and so did you glean any information from your previous startup with Dumbala? Yeah, so um, we, we run into it. In fact, we ran into it this week. Uh, we really don't have a good way of doing order fulfillment within Dumbala, uh, and, and we haven't really had a need uh, for that. And we're just having a discussion, and we're like, well, we've never done anything like that before. Uh, so as we walked around the table, uh, we said, okay, well, how have we done it in the past? Uh, what would be the best way of trying to introduce that uh, here in this organization, and what do we think would work? So we reach back into our past experiences on how we've done things before, and then we apply it to the, uh, the current situation. Hi. Uh, did did uh, anyone else from SPI go back into uh, startups again, or are you the only person from the original SPI group that went back? Um, no. So, so SPI, when uh, we were about 140 people, um, HP retained about 120 uh, of the staff through the acquisition. Um, since then, we've had uh, several of the uh, members of the leadership team that have moved on to other startups. Our uh, CTO and founder uh, is now in a startup out on the West Coast. Uh, our uh, VP of sales uh, moved on to another startup. I've moved on to another startup. Um, so we've given our time over to the, the acquiring company. You wanted about a two-year commitment to make sure that the transition was smooth. And there's a lot of emotional capital that goes into the startup that you want to make sure is, it, it lands well uh, in the acquiring company. Um, but once you, you've done that, then you kind of look around and say, hey, is this going to be a, a long-term commitment or, or do I want to go somewhere else? Um, and, and then everybody's got to make their own individual choices in that case. There was one over here. Um, so, Dumbala, I hear their primary um, system is a, it does, it's designed to protect against botnet attacks on corporate networks. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if you could explain to us a little more about how that system works. Is it more of a blacklist or does it, blacklist or does it intelligently detect threats or is that all proprietary information? That's a great question. So you've done some research on Dumbala. Um, Dumbala is an appliance that sits in a network and it will sit um, behind the DNS server. 
uh, behind the proxy server or at the egress points. And it will look at DNS traffic. And when it sees a, uh, a request from an asset that's going out to a, um, uh, a host that's known to be uh, a bad host, uh, it will flag that as a compromised asset. Uh, and so there is a, a, um, a blacklist component to the, to the application. Uh, there's also what we're calling a reputation component uh, to the application because a lot of these botnets, they change their um, IP and um, uh, their, 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 their IP and host name. And so um, uh, what we have to do is we have to look at these requests and say, okay, well, you're making a request out to some place that uh, has a suspicious type of a reputation. Um, now, we can't say for sure that it is a badguy.com, um, but it might be. Um, and badguy.com actually might be sitting on a legitimate site, so it might be a legitimate request that's being made. Uh, so we have to go through an algorithm to determine whether or not that that is a suspicious um, or a compromised uh, request. Dembala. Have any uh, angel investors? And uh, if it didn't, how'd you, uh, I guess, convince venture capitalists to um, invest in your company? So Dimbala has been around for about four years. It's an interesting story. Um, and uh, Dimbala had had uh, received a couple of rounds of funding. Uh, it was actually founded from a couple of professors here at Georgia Tech. Um, its original business model was uh, to actually stream uh, information about botnets and um, uh, and, and malware, and then allow companies to, to, to get this and use this uh, as a, a detection, um, uh, detection product. Well, there wasn't a lot of money, or, or they really weren't able to, to figure out the business model behind uh, that type of a product. So about a year and a half ago, they changed the, uh, the model and have, have built an appliance and have put software onto that appliance, and, they're, and we're now starting to get traction with that model. So it's a little bit different from where we're several years removed from an angel around of investors, and, and, I, and I wasn't around in the, in the early days. So uh, I am working now with the current round of, of venture capitalists, and this is actually our, um, our C or D round uh, that, we just, that we closed about a year ago. My question is, what would you say are the characteristics of a successful startup and then the characteristics of someone who works well within a startup? That's a good question. Um, I think uh, the characteristics of a successful startup will be uh, the impact that that startup is having uh, within its industry. So um, that could be number of customers, it could be sales, um, it could be that there was a transaction at the end where it was an IPO or an acquisition. Uh, a lot of startups are, are looking to say, okay, that's really truly the, the definition of, of, of did I do, was I successful? Uh, some startups just go on to become their own companies. Uh, let me look at Microsoft. I mean, it was a startup at one point in time. Um, but uh, truly the, the, the people that are successful within the startups, if they had had uh, uh, any characteristics, maybe some of the other ones that, that I didn't put up there, uh, would be a passion for learning. Uh, somebody that has a, a, just an insatiable curiosity about um, uh, whatever their idea is uh, and, and is, um, uh, just has a focus around that uh, to where there's always gonna be a lot of noise, but he'd be able to, to, to get through all of that noise and say, this is what we have to do, and this is going to work, and I know it's going to work, because there's going to be a gut feel to a, to a lot of this stuff when you're, when you're working with a startup. Um, that's the characteristic, I think, of a good leader within a, a, a startup, is, is, is really knowing how to differentiate um, uh, and, or navigate those waters um, uh, through all of the, the, the various distractions that you might have and, and, and keeping your eye uh, on the end game. A question. Um, many, uh, many folks actually go into startups after they've had experience in larger companies. In fact, the average entrepreneur has experienced a larger company before they tend to start their first significant venture. And that was certainly your case, too, I think, with some period of time you spent with EMY. And I guess my question for you is that many of these students may go through a similar type of transition. 
What was the biggest surprise in terms of going from a big company type of environment to moving into a startup? And it's, it's sort of, how did you handle that transition? Um, the, the transition I, I thought was actually pretty easy because most of the surprises were uh, welcomed surprises. Um, when I was, prior to Spy Dynamics, I was working for Worldspan. Typical day at Worldspan would probably consist of seven to eight hours worth of meetings, um, of which I probably needed to be in about 15 minutes of those. Uh, you go to a startup and all of a sudden there's nothing on your calendar, nothing on your calendar for all week. You know, uh, and you're the one that actually has to start uh, uh, figuring out, okay, how do I want to, to create an organization around this? Um, so you don't have a lot of the bureaucracy uh, and, and, and the, um, uh, the stuff that really, I, at least for me, uh, find just kind of um, uh, is, is not motivating. Um, so I found that, that, that going to a startup and having a lot more control, a lot more flexibility on how you wanted to, uh, to organize and, and do your work was was a welcome surprise. What was the most difficult part of raising your Series A in 2001? Um, you know, we raised the Series A, we closed in December of 2001, and obviously it was shortly after September 11th. Um, September 11th came and the VC money uh, actually dried up. Uh, we we probably would not have raised that round had we not hired uh, Brian Cohen, who was CEO of Spy Dynamics. He was, uh, had some gray hair. Uh, he had been through this um, once before uh, and had experience uh, as a CEO. Uh, so he brought the maturity that uh, the VCs were looking for to give them enough confidence that they would be willing to invest in this company. Uh, without that, I don't think that uh, the VCs uh, would have um, would have given us the money. Um, that and combined that it was it was a great idea, um, and the product at the time uh, would sell itself. I remember one meeting that that we were in. Um, we actually took the product and pointed it at the VC website uh, and hacked in. And I remember our CTO. He says, "Well, let's make Spy Dynamics one of the portfolio companies. We'll just make this change right here." Uh, and and they they under that allowed the VCs to understand the power behind the application and the value that it would bring. Any other questions? Kevin, thanks for coming to Georgia Tech today. Thank you for your time. <laughs>